Matthew chapter 21 this evening, and uh, please join me there in God's Word, Matthew chapter 21. I've titled the message by way of a question. And the question is, who is this? And the question comes out of our text for this evening's message from Matthew chapter number 21. Palm Sunday. And... And so we'll look at Matthew chapter 21, and uh, let's drop down to verses 10 and 11, please. 10 and 11. And when he was come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. Well, let's pray. Lord, we thank you. Thank you so much for making it possible for us to uh, meet together with you uh, again this beautiful Lord's Day. We thank you for your word. We need your word, and we're asking you, Heavenly Father, please speak to us right out of your word, and I pray into our hearts, and Lord, give us the help, the encouragement, and even uh, our faith. Strengthen our faith, grow our faith, Lord, and do that by your word. And we'll thank you for it all. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now, you see in verse 11, the name of Jesus, and the Greek word, The Greek word is pronounced in this way, Jesus. And it means Jehovah is salvation. So uh, Palm Sunday, Palm Sunday uh, signifies the arrival of of the sacrificial lamb in Jerusalem. Go to John the Gospel. Now you want to mark your place here in Matthew, but what is Palm Sunday? It is the arrival of the sacrificial lamb of God in Jerusalem. He has arrived, and he knows he's arrived for the express purpose purpose of being sacrificed. We look at John chapter 1. And uh, verse 29. The next day, John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Did you know that? If you know Jesus, he has taken away your sin. It's taken away. 
If you know Jesus, your sin, all of it has been taken away. Now I want you to go to Zechariah and uh, in, uh, and so do your best to uh, find Zechariah. And if you see Haggai, <clears throat> you're close. And then in Zechariah, I'd like you to look at, um, I'd like you to see a prophecy that was given in 487 B.C., okay? by the prophet Zechariah and fulfilled. And uh, we just read about the fulfillment in Matthew. All right, now Zechariah chapter nine and verse number nine. <clears throat> the prophet inspired by God Rejoice <clears throat> greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. Did you notice in your Bible, King? is spelled with a, well, it should be spelled with a capital K. Do you know what that means, the capital K? It, 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 literally, it literally means uh, the king of kings, uh, and it denotes, the capital denotes deity. It means, uh, it means God. Thy king cometh unto thee, he is just, and having salvation, lowly, and riding upon an ass, and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. So the prophet prophesied in 487 B.C. the coming of God to Jerusalem. How incredible is that? Now, so we want to go back to Matthew chapter number 21. And so let's go back to uh, our text there. In Matthew in chapter <clears throat> Matthew in chapter number twenty one. So who is this? <laughs> this is Jehovah. This is this is God. <laughs> it's it's the, the day, it's the occasion that God, riding upon the foal of an ass, lowly, comes into Jerusalem, the Lamb of God, the sacrificial Lamb. Wow, how amazing. How amazing is that? How wonderful that is. Now, uh, so we'll go to Matthew chapter 21, and, and uh, let's, let's go back up to verse number one, and we'll get some more detail about Palm Sunday from God's Word. And so in verse number one, and when they drew nigh unto Jerusalem, and were come to Beth, Beth Page, unto the Mount of Olives, then sent Jesus 
two disciples, saying unto them, Go into the village over against you, and straightway ye shall find an ass tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them unto me. And if any man say aught unto you, ye shall say, The Lord hath need of them, and straightway he will send them. Straightway, immediately, he will uh, send them uh, with those disciples. So, um, do you see the word Lord as it appears in uh, verse number three? The Lord. The Greek word here that is, <clears throat> that is used is uh, the word kurios. And it means, it means uh, he to whom a thing belongs or the owner. Isn't, how interesting is that? <laughs> Think about this with me. I just want you to meditate on this for a moment. So here's a man who has in his possession uh, these two animals and on this particular day, the disciples of Christ come to him and say to him, the Lord hath need of them. So from the Greek, and we learn their answer to this man who possesses these animals is, the owner has need of them. Wait a minute, wait a minute, I'm confused. Those are my animals. That, that uh, could have been his re reply. What do you mean the owner has need of, I'm the owner. But you know what? That's not his response. Uh, Here's, here's a man who recognizes his rightful place. He understands, I'm not the owner. I'm the steward of the owner. The owner is the Lord. And all I do is to manage according to his will, his property. And here the owner has sent these men to me and is requesting the use of these two animals. And uh, I just, his response is such a blessing. Uh, and, you know, when you see it, or, uh, well, and, and, and straightway he will send them, <clears throat> meaning immediately. And so, uh, <clears throat> look at uh, Psalm 24 and verse number 1. There's some great lessons in this whole, uh, you know, account of uh, what is uh, called Palm Sunday. And uh, so we look at uh, Psalm 24 and verse number 1. Praise the Lord, Psalm 24 and verse number 1. Psalm of David, again, inspired by God. But uh, boy, look at this, Psalm 24, verse number one. And this is what uh, the, the, the steward of, these, of the Lord, the caretaker of these animals, he understood this. The Lord, the earth, rather, the earth is the Lord's and the what? Church. You see that, don't you? The earth and everything that appertains to the earth, everything that comes out of the earth, from the earth, everything that has the earth in it, everything that is made from the earth, you know, um, <clears throat> says, yeah, it's powerful, isn't it? 
uh, in the fullness thereof. The world. <laughs> and they that dwell therein. Huh. See, the, the saved, hopefully, the, the saved understands this timeless truth, but the unsaved, uh, they need to understand this, that uh, they, yeah, even they belong uh, to uh, the Lord. The owner, Kurios, he to whom uh, everything belongs. Uh, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 4, and uh, so we'll go there. <clears throat> First. Corinthians chapter <clears throat> number 4, and uh, we'll look at verse number, uh, uh, verse number 2, just one verse. Moreover, it is required, God requires this in stewards, that a man be found faithful. What does that mean, that a steward be found faithful? Well, a steward is... Uh, is one who manages another's property, another's goods, and other's resources in keeping with our text, all that belongs to God. And uh, the aspect of being faithful with the stewardship means that it is being used in accord with the will of the owner. That's faithful stewardship. I am... Uh, I'm going to God's word. I'm understanding from God's word how the owner wants me to manage all that belongs to him. It all belongs to him. And I'm following the word of God in the management of his goods, his resources. And God calls that faithful stewardship. And so what, a, what an excellent example in our text in Matthew <clears throat> chapter number 21. And, and so if the Lord requests from you, from me, something, anything that belongs to him, would we respond the way this steward in our text responds? Immediately. Straightway is the word, and it does mean immediately. He sends those two animals with those disciples to the owner, the Lord. Now, let me give you this great promise. It is a great promise, and uh, we do well to uh, hear this uh, from time to time in the Gospel of Luke in chapter 6, and uh, hear these words of Jesus. Hear, hear the words of the owner. Here's the owner speaking. <clears throat> and uh, as it pertains to uh, giving by way of stewardship, uh, Jesus says in Luke 6, 38, Give, and it shall be given unto you. Wow, how powerful is that? Uh, for what a man sows, that shall he also reap. Amen. The law of sowing and reaping. And here he says, give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down and shaken together uh, and running over, you know, shall men give into your bosom. You know, I, I'm telling you folks, this you talk about uh, a fulfillment of this promise for Gateway Baptist Church. Uh, as a church corporately managing God's goods, God's resources, uh, giving as God guides, as God commands, as God directs, uh, in uh, for His work, His service. I, I've never, I honestly, I. I know, I keep going back to this roofing. Huh. We paid for 7,000 square feet of shingles 
they delivered 9,800 square feet of shingles. <laughs> Do you just realize what happened for Gateway Baptist Church? I believe it's a fulfillment of Luke 6 and verse number 38 to the church. I really do, folks. Um, that's, a, that's a blessing from God. That's a God send. And uh, uh, shall men give into your bosom? I don't know if they realize what they did, but I, I just give God thanks and praise. I mean, uh, I told them what they did. I sent them photographs showing them what they did. Yeah. And he said, that's great. The manager said, that's great. <laughs> well, I'll amen that. Amen. That's great. <laughs> what enough shingles. You know, we well, see how far beyond just that child ministry building we've gone. And, you know, we're just 15 bundles away now from completing you know, wow, praise God. I mean, uh, talk about a literal fulfillment of this. And uh, <clears throat> for with the same measure that ye meet with all, it shall be measured to you again, God says. Um, so you know, understand then that giving is returning to God uh, you know, that which belongs to him. God may request. Um, God may request someone someone return their life unto Him. God may say, "I want your life. I want your life for my work, my service." Um, and if God says that to one of you, what what would your response be then to God? Oh. I know from experience, and I, I can tell you from experience, if God wants your life for his work and service, he will let you know. You say, well, how will I know? Oh, you'll know. You'll know. Um, if God places his call upon you for his work, It is, there'll be nothing else on your mind. You'll wake up to his call. You'll go to sleep to his call. You'll spend all day long hearing his call. <laughs> and uh, now, of course, you have to, you have to respond. You, you, you have to uh, answer his call and, you know, um, it's like somebody said, uh, there are three answers to prayer, yes, no, and wait. And I, I suppose you could, I, you know, I, I, I put God on hold for three years. <laughs> I don't recommend you do that. I did. And uh, my life was absolutely miserable, miserable. And uh, so I would counsel in this way when, uh, and, and you'll know if God calls you, you'll know. I would answer you to say, yes, Lord, here am I, you know. Uh, but let's go to Isaiah chapter six, <clears throat> Isaiah chapter number six. So, you know, sometimes God may, may the owner may want to use, um, may want to use a donkey and a foal he may want to use a tool. Maybe you have a tool he wants to use. Maybe he'll, maybe he'll, the owner will ask you to direct some of his resource in a particular way, somehow into his work. But on occasion, the owner may say, I want you. I want your life. Give me your life. And he does do that. Now, uh, but, you know, the question is, and, and if he does do that, how will you respond to that, to the owner? Look at Isaiah chapter 6, and I just want you to look at this uh, one verse. 
in Isaiah chapter number 6. Uh, uh, also, the prophet now, obviously called by God, uh, also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Who shall I send and who will go for us? That's God asking. Go for us. Go for the Heavenly Father, for God the Son, for God the Holy Ghost, the Godhead. Who will go for us? And this response, it really, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a wonderful response in verse number 8. Then said I, the, the prophet responding, then said I, here am I, send me. Here am I, send me. What a wonderful response to God's call. Now, um, let's go back to Matthew, our text, please. Matthew, uh, and we're uh, in Matthew chapter 21, I do believe. So we'll go back to Matthew chapter number 21 on this Palm Sunday. And... Uh, And let's, uh, let's drop down to verse number 8. We'll, look, uh, we'll read uh, verses uh, 8 and on. And uh, <clears throat> a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. In the way. What does that mean? Huh. They, they put their clothing on the ground, on the ground, or even in the dirt. And when, you know, when you, when you stop and you consider the value and the worth of clothing those 2,000 years ago, the, look, uh, their clothing was not coming across the ocean on a container ship being mass manufactured. Their, their clothing was hand made. I mean, they poured their lives into clothing. And now here they are putting it on the ground. Others cut down branches from the trees and strawed them in the way. And, and of course, the way refers to um, just ahead of Jesus and in the direction that Jesus was, was uh, riding on the, on the foal of the, of the ass there. Uh, so garments in the way, garments on the ground in... Uh, and uh, let's uh, let's continue on here in verse number nine, and, and the multitudes and the multitudes that went before and that followed cried, saying, "Hosanna! Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is he that cometh." In the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. Wow. In the name of the Lord, again, Kurios, this title is given to God, the Messiah. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Kurios, God, the Messiah. Now, many of them knew this about Jesus. Many of them knew this, and I believe the Pharisees knew it about Jesus. They knew this was God. 
they understood who this was riding upon the foal of an ass into Jerusalem. The reason they threw down their garments, they lined the way with the palm fronds, is they understood this is God. And they were, they were showing, uh, they were showing him honor and respect. Uh, look at uh, look at uh, the Gospel of John and uh, chapter eight and verse number twenty four. These words of of the Lord, of the Lord Jesus, in John 8 and verse number 24. I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins. Now remember, this is Jesus Christ speaking. For if ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins sins. Um, do you remember God's answer to Moses when Moses said to God, uh, whom shall I tell Pharaoh hath sent me? Do you remember what God commanded Moses to say to Pharaoh? He, he said, you know, uh, you say to Pharaoh, I am that I am hath sent me. <laughs> Who is Jesus Christ? He is the great I am. And uh, if ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. Wow. Look at John 1, the Gospel of John, chapter 1, and verse number 1. Um, the Pharisees, in fact, tried to stone Jesus, and the reason they cited unto Jesus for wanting to kill him with, uh, by hurling rocks at him, they said... Uh, because thou being a man, makest thyself God. Oh, they knew. They knew who Jesus is. But in John 1, and verse 1, and verse 14, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 14, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory the glory as of the only begotten of the father full of grace and truth for by grace are ye saved now i want you to go to a very special passage in genesis chapter 22 concerning the identity of Jesus Christ. And all of these, all of these doctrines uh, trail back to the book of beginnings. All major Bible doctrines, uh, they're, they're all uh, found in Genesis, including this doctrine of the... Um, identity of Jesus Christ. Now look at this in, uh, in Genesis chapter number 22. And uh, of course, <clears throat> this is the account of um, God's command to Abraham to sacrifice his only son, Isaac. Does anybody re remember the name, uh, the, uh, um, the land where this sacrifice was to uh, take place? the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon 
one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. All right, now um, <clears throat> let's drop down to verse 8 of Genesis chapter number 22. Um, boy. And Abraham said, uh, because uh, Isaac, they had the wood, um, they, had, they had the knife, they had the wood, but you know what they didn't have for this sacrifice? Do you know what was missing? And, and Isaac questions Abraham, his father, about it. Um, well, look at verse 7. And Isaac spake unto Abraham, his father, and said, My father, and he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, So Isaac now, you know, Isaac is starting to think and, you know, kind of, <laughs> Look around here, and he says, uh, uh, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Where's the lamb? Special emphasis upon the word lamb, the sacrificial lamb. I want you to look at the answer in verse number 8. And Abraham said, My son... Boy, don't miss this. God will provide himself a lamb. Do you realize what Abraham just told Isaac? The sacrificial lamb is God. God is that lamb. And God will provide himself a lamb. For a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. Wow, how amazing is that? Do you realize the gospel was being proclaimed thousands of years ago? The gospel is found in the Old Testament as well as the New Testament. God is that lamb. And have you ever wondered why Isaac did not, uh, you know, the survival instinct? You know, Dad, you're not, you're not, you're not going to, uh, you know, put me on that altar and, and plunge a knife in, into my body? And did you ever wonder... Uh, well, both Abraham and Isaac believed. They believed the gospel. Abraham believed that God would raise up Isaac, who would raise him up. Faith. And so this was a demonstration of their faith in God. God will provide himself a lamb. He is the lamb. Um, well, let's go back to Matthew chapter number 21. Isn't that something... God told Adam and Eve, and you know, in the day you eat thereof, ye shall die. <laughs> and God's the one who then came and died. So that we could live. If we're willing to believe in the sacrificial lamb which taketh away the sins of the world. Um, Matthew chapter 21, and now we uh, are in, uh, in verse 12 and uh, verse 12 and 13. So, and Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all them that sold and bought. 
And where were they selling and buying of all places? In the house of the Lord. Now, you know, the Bible, the, um, some would say they were buying and selling sacrificial animals, um, possibly, uh, but perhaps uh, other things as well. Um, and uh, over, th- uh, so uh, <clears throat> he uh, went into the temple of God and cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves. I mean, think about that. The, uh, so what, what is going on there? What is that all about? Um, it, it is, it is uh, the spiritual condition that we find in God's house. Um, yeah, look at look at what God's house is to be in verse number thirteen, and and uh, Jesus said unto them, "It is written, My house shall be called the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves." I mean. What is behind this that has degraded the house of the Lord to becoming a place of buying and selling and, and, and defrauding and deceit and cheating and lying? Um. Merchandising, making merchandise of people. Second Peter chapter two. There's a warning in Second Peter chapter two. I mean, you know, it's like um, wow. Second Peter chapter two. Verse 1 through 3. But uh, there, were, there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily, you know, with stealth, with secrecy, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction and many shall follow their pernicious, means harmful ways, destructive ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. Uh, This kind of misbehavior within the house of the Lord, the Old Testament, or even the local New Testament church, the assembly of the saints of God, constituting God's temple today, uh, this kind of Uh, uh, activity invites the uh, the uh, even the criticism of the world have you ever you know have have you ever heard this have you ever heard this statement well all they want is my money you know I'm not going to church because that's all they're after is my money. God help us. 
God help us. In this, in this matter of buying and selling in the house of the Lord. <laughs> um, look, at, look at verse 3 of, uh, of 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse number 3. And, uh, and through covetousness. Covetousness, which by the way, literally means the love of money. You know, the question is, you know, why are they doing this in the temple? Because you know what's happened? They're not in love with God, but do you know who they are in love with? They're in love with covetousness means lovers of silver. What did Jesus say? You cannot love God and mammon. You know, people travel from the world then to come to the house of the Lord. And they come to the temple. And they're making merchandise of the people. And they're cheating the people. And, and God's house has just become a place, a marketplace. A place to merchandise. And, and through covetousness shall they with feigned words, that means dishonest words, make merchandise of you. They're, they're not interested in that resource being dedicated to the cause of Christ. Do you know what their interest was then? And in, I'm sad to say, so many scenarios even today, their, their interest in that, in that resource is not to lavish it upon God and upon His work, but upon themselves. Whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. I think it's called fleecing the flock. You ever heard that term? Fleecing the flock. Jeremiah chapter 6, Jeremiah chapter 6, and uh, listen, I, I'm telling you, the, the church needs to be on guard constantly about this. We, we, we don't come here to merchandise. We come here to worship God. Really, we don't come here to buy and sell things. We come here to worship God. We come here to talk to God. We come here to pray to God. We come here to pray for others. We come here to preach the gospel. We come here to send out the gospel. You know, uh, it's Jeremiah chapter 6. And everything is accounted for. Everything, every resource, it is accountable. How it is used, where it is sent. Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse number 13. And from the least of them, even unto the greatest of them, everyone is given to covetousness. This was the spiritual condition of of God's people then and and everyone is given to covetousness that is the the love of money and from the prophet even unto the priest everyone dealeth falsely Every single one of them. God help 
us. Ezekiel chapter 33. Ezekiel chapter 33, please. And verse 31. Wow. Look at this. I want you to see this. You need to see this. Verse 31, Ezekiel chapter 33. And they come unto thee as the people cometh, and they sit before thee as my people. This is from God's vantage point. This is what God sees. It's what God knows. And they hear thy words... But they will not do them, for with their mouth they show much love, but with but their heart goeth after their what? What did Jesus say um, about the heart? He said. Uh, but their heart is far from me. You know, their mouth, they, 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 they speak all the, the right words, they say all the right things. Sounds good. But when God looks at the heart, but their heart goeth after their covetousness, the great hindrance, the great hindrance to God's work today is that people, and I'm sad to say, are trying to love God and mammon, riches, things, can't be done. Not going to happen. So, on this occasion, when Jesus cleansed the temple, he encountered people who were in love with money, in love with things, and they were using the people. They were making merchandise of the people. And Jesus wasn't having it. He didn't have it then, he wouldn't have it then, he won't have it now. Go to Micah chapter 2. Micah chapter 2, please. <clears throat> In Micah, the prophet, chapter 2. And you know, uh, we, we uh, you know, the Bible says keep yourself in the love of God. Keep yourself in the love of God. Now God's not going to fall out of love with you. But we need to understand, we, we are always, always, just one decision away from falling out of love with Him. Micah chapter 2, verse 1 through three, so, and uh, Micah chapter two, verse one through three. Woe to them, woe means judgment to them that devise iniquity and work evil upon their beds when the morning light, when the morning is light, they practice it because it is in the power of their hand, and they covet. They covet fields and take them by violence, and houses and take them away. So they oppress a man and his house, even a man and his heritage, his inheritance. Yeah. So what is God saying? So, so 
the activity at the temple, it became, how can I get what he's got? I want what he has. And by hook or crook, I'll get it. <laughs> I want that vehicle. Or I want this, or I want that. <laughs> that was happening. Um... Verse uh, 3, therefore, thus saith the Lord, behold, against, thus saith the Lord. Now look, against this family do I, do I devise an evil from which ye shall not remove your necks, neither shall ye go haughtily, for this time is evil. God says, I'm going to deal with this. Habakkuk, if you would please, Habakkuk. The prophet Habakkuk. Just go, just go a few pages uh, toward the New Testament. You see Nahum, you're right there. Zephaniah, you went too far. Habakkuk. Habakkuk, chapter... Um, you know, see, a little background. I, I just, we read about Jesus going into the house of the Lord and driving them out with a whip. And this is a little background. It's important that we understand that from God's word, we get to look into the hearts, the same hearts that Jesus looked into on that very day on Palm uh, what we refer to here as Palm Sunday and to understand what he saw and, and what, what was happening in the house of the Lord. And he wasn't having it. Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 9 and 10. Woe! Again, judgment to him that coveteth an evil covetousness to his house. <laughs> now look at this. Can you believe this? That he may set his nest on high. What does that mean? means move up. It means dissatisfaction, discontentment. It means, uh, it means greed. It means lust. It means ungratefulness, unthankfulness for God's plan in your life and Trying to manipulate, trying to merchandise, trying to take advantage of others so that you can better yourself through deceit and corruption and dishonesty. This is what Jesus saw 2,000 years ago. This is what was going on in the house of the Lord. They weren't there to worship God, to love God, to serve God. They were there to move their nest up. Wow. Woe to him that coveteth an evil covetousness to his house, that he may set his nest on high, that, that he may uh, be delivered from the power of evil, do you understand what that's saying? Be delivered from the power of evil? If I can just get enough, enough money. Then nothing can touch me. Oh, 
Oh, really? Is that the way it works? So money becomes the savior. Money becomes the protector. Money becomes the all in all. And, and no evil can touch a person that has enough money. You know, there are people that are dying right now that have all of the money that a heart and a soul could desire. And all of their money won't save them from the disease that is killing their body. That's the reality. What a warped, perverted way of thinking. But that's what happens when we fall out of love with God and we fall into love with money. Everything is perverted and distorted. And instead of loving one another, being genuinely concerned about one another as we should be. What Jesus found 2,000 years ago was a, 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 a house of God with corrupt people who were not interested in the welfare of one another, but how can I get what you have? By hook or crook. Luke, Luke chapter 12 and verse number 15. And uh, I don't want to go to a church like that. I don't want to be in a church like that. And I don't want this church to be like that. When somebody, when somebody says, Pastor Ellis, how you doing? I want it to be because they have the love of God in them and they genuinely do care. And when this pastor says to any of you, how are you doing? I want it to be because I have the love of God in my life. And because I genuinely care about you. And not because I'm trying to get anything from you or take anything from you. But just because I, I have God's love operating in my life. That's the kind of church I want to be in. Look at this in Luke chapter 12 and verse number 15. Uh, <clears throat> and, uh, and he said unto them, you know, this account, the, the, the two uh, brothers, they were fighting over the inheritance. Uh, I don't know, their dad, their mom, somebody died, left them an inheritance. And they wanted Jesus to become the, uh, the uh, you know, to divide their estate and uh, in verse 15, he said unto them, take heed and beware of covetousness, the love of money. For a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. Mark, inspired by God, put it this way, What shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Um, back to Matthew, please. Wow. Um, and Matthew chapter 21. And uh, let's uh, drop down to verse number 9. And uh, the, the multitudes, <clears throat> the multitudes, um, verse 9, where am I? And the multitudes uh, went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna means... Uh, Propitious. When I want to name Hosanna. What does the word Hosanna mean? It means propitious. Now, boy, what does that mean? And here's quite literally what they're... This is what they're crying out to, to him 
whom they recognize to be God. They know who this is, and the Pharisees know who this is. And the Pharisees think if we can just kill him, then we can have it all. But the multitudes are crying out, Hosanna! Hosanna! And what they're quite literally asking God to do is to pay for our sins. That's what it means. Hosanna means atone for our sins. Pay for our sins. God, pay for our sins. They understood that by the law they were being condemned. They understood that they could not attain salvation by the law, only condemnation. They understood that God was the only propitiation for their sins. And they're crying out, oh God, pay for our sins. Wow. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now, for whosoever shall call, and you know that's what they're doing. Literally, quite literally, they're calling upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Shall be saved. I'll close with this in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. If you would, please, it'll be our final verse. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I hope you've called. I hope you've called upon the Lord. Oh, I hope you've called upon the Lord for your atonement, for your sins to be paid for. The law won't save you. The purpose of the law has never been to save you. But God's purpose of the law is to condemn you. To convince you that you are guilty as charged. And to compel you to turn on to Jesus Christ. For salvation now get myself to second corinthians chapter number five second corinthians chapter five and verse number 19 here it is to wit wit to know to understand that wow now look at this who was in christ oh wow would you look at that Jesus riding on the foal of an ass. Christ, and who's in him? God was in Christ. Reconciling the world unto himself. Reconcile is to restore To friendship with God. It is to make acceptable unto God. Not imputing their trespasses unto them. And hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Our message is. Jesus Christ. And Christ alone. For salvation, forgiveness of sin. Let's pray. Father, Palm Sunday, wow, wow. And what you saw in the hearts of people that professed to know you 2,000 years ago when you went into that temple, wow, wow. And you took care of business. 
You drove it out of your house. All of it. My house is a house of prayer. And this church is a place where we come to do business with God. To love God, to love one another, and to send the gospel out that they too might hear of your love, of your salvation. God, uh, I hope when you hear we love you in this church, I, I hope when you look into our hearts, you find that we do love you and that we're not in love with money or things, but that we actually do love you. We don't have to trust in money to take care of us. Our promotion does not come from money. All of that comes from you. And our trust is in you, not money. God bless your word in Jesus' name.